We're in the midst of a huge transformation where peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Nessa Johnson. She is the Global Chief People Officer at GCI Health. Nessa, it's so good to see you. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, thank you, Christina, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Nessa Johnson, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I've been doing um, HR for roughly almost 20 years now, um, and I am really excited to be at GCI Health. Um, You know, that question about what I wanted to be when I grew up was always changing and literally inspired by almost everything I saw in the world around me. Um, so I what I would say I wanted to be everything. And thankfully, I was supported by a grandmother who um, was very supportive of me being, um, you know, willing to to be everything. And her famous quote to me was be a Renaissance woman. So I kind of went into the world with that thought in my mind that I can technically be everything I want to be. Oh, I love that grandma be a Renaissance woman. I'm going <laughs> to remember that as someone who's very close to their uh, grandmother as well. I definitely relate to that too. And I think a lot of people are thinking about what they want to be, who they want to be in the future and how their job is really related to that as well. What they're thinking about in terms of expectations from their employers too. One study showed that 47% of employees reported that their stress was literally higher than anything they'd experienced in their career, but only 37 percent agreed that the organization really understood what they needed both in their personal lives and for their families. How would you answer the question of how you're showing up fully for the lives of employees at GCI Health? Yeah, so this is one of the main things that attracted me to join the company. Um, the ethos of GCI is very much um, our tagline, which is inspired by people. Um, one of the things that's really struck me about the organization is that our mission as an agency is intentionally inwardly facing um, with people at the center. So our mission is really about attracting, retaining, growing our people, um, which is not something you often see out of an organization. Um, And I think that there's so many proof points of how GCI is inspired by people, leading with people at the center. Um, And another thing that we talk a lot about as an organization is that we believe as a company, we do have the responsibility to provide tools and the environment for people to be successful, not only in their professional lives, but in their personal lives as well. Um, And the thing that I would probably point to specifically is that um, we have something internally called the People Pact. And the People Pact is essentially our um, employee value proposition that was created for and with people um, at the center and really based on employee feedback that came out of uh, the working group of people that we brought together to create the People Pact and also um, our first employee engagement survey that was launched in 2021. Um, The People Pact is essentially a four quadrants that kind of cover our commitments that we want to make to the work experience for all of our employees. It's globally focused, but it is customized at the local level. And um, it kind of covers our agency experience, our focus on you as an individual, our commitment to team, and then the difference we make. I love that, the people pact. Uh, That's a great way to to look at it as well and really think strategically too. Uh, You mentioned at the beginning, you're the global chief people officer as well. So a global organization across different time zones, across geography. We often get this question around what needs to remain global and what is local in your people and talent approach. Yeah, what I would say is that, um, you know, that people pact is what we would consider to be the common tie globally for us as an organization, because the things that fall under the People Pact end up being um, these larger sort of values commitments that we're making to people, but how they're going to show up locally in each market will be informed by the market. Um, For example, under our agency experience, we have a People Pact that, um, that reads 
that we will advocate and aim to ensure enable work life flexibility, but how that shows up in the US versus the UK looks a little bit different in terms of how we structure our work weeks. Um, but each of our work weeks are designed in such a way that we're allowing time for people to have uninterrupted meeting times. For example, in the US, we have a ways of working um, approach. Um, it's a set of guidelines that helps us um, by um, carving out time um, on Friday afternoons, not to have any non-urgent meetings so that people can really work on getting some things done. Yeah, you have that framework or, or guidelines and then you're empowered to execute based on the, the local market needs and as leaders, as managers, um, and really enable folks to do their best work while having those non-negotiables from the company too, um, and the resources as well. I think that is really important to retention of employees, ensuring that people do feel uh, fulfilled in their in their role and that they're set up for success. Something else that uh, has come up in these conversations and in other research is around kind of the the growth in, in the role too. How are you incorporating learning and development into the culture at GCI Health? If you could provide uh, some examples for folks who are listening. I wholeheartedly agree with you when it comes to you know how much the world is changing and how the views of the workplace are changing, which is why it's gonna be so important for us as we continue to look at the People Pact as something that is a live and living document that we continue to ask for input into that. Um, but on the learning and development side, um, globally, each market offers training and development opportunities on a regular basis. Um, I'll speak to the US side of things just because I'm a little closer to that one, is that we've uh, launched a framework for learning and development that covers five different pillars of learning that range from the technical to the personal, which is another way that I think we reflect that commitment to seeing people be successful in their personal and their professional life. And on average, we have about two or three offerings per month um, of learning and development for our team. Um, the other ways that we have invested in learning and development is our mentorship program. We have a mentorship program that we do annually. And recently we launched a speed mentoring program that was very well received. Um, it was the first of its kind and uh, people really liked the aspect of being able to um, network with people that they don't normally spend time with and bring a specific uh, challenge that they're facing and get um, three different points of view on that challenge in a very quick period of time with 20 minute sessions a piece. Um, it was really fun to put that on and we received great feedback. Um, and then just a couple of other things to kind of touch on. We have a, um, we have traditionally done a cross office exchange program from New York to London where um, two employees will be selected to kind of trade spots and then um, from our New York and London office for a few weeks and be able to um, understand ways of working in a different country and get exposure to new client accounts. Um, and then lastly, we offer uh, free LinkedIn learning accounts for employees, which I feel is like a great tool that we constantly lean into when an employee approaches us and says, you know, oh, I'm one, I'm curious about something new, or I'm really struggling with how to, you know, you know, navigate team dynamics. We often lean into what's available online, especially because it's self-paced. So it ends up being very helpful for them to have a place to go and learn on their own timeline. Yeah, I think training and development is really important and investing in that time. Also, the power of connections across the organization and departments and different levels at the company, too, no matter where you sit. As we continue to peel back the, the onion of company culture in terms of uh, professional development and building those connections with your, your colleagues as well, can you tell me about the connection you see between well-being uh, in every sense of the word, belonging and creative that really creating that really inclusive culture uh, for everyone at GCI Health, whether it's day one for them or day 500. Oh, great question. Um, you know, when I think about well-being, belonging, and inclusion, I really see them as being overlapping, but I also see it starting with well-being for both leaders and employees alike. Um, I think it goes without saying, especially in the time since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, is that we really need to take care of our bodies and our minds to lead today because leading today is now a full body sport. You know, you have to put in everything to lead today, uh, whether you're 
doing this remotely or in person, it is a new way of leading. Um, and so if we really show up any less than uh, fully ourselves, we won't have the resources to build the inclusive cultures that can yield that sense of belonging, which is what's so important. So I really first think it has to do with leaders investing in themselves. They are gonna be the bellwether of the culture. And if they can produce that inclusive culture, everyone will have a sense of belonging. Well-being is really critical. It starts with that self-awareness, that inner work too, and it really manifests in belonging, really taking those actions day to day to create an inclusive and empowering culture. Um, and I also think, you know, you might not be talking to the global chief people officer every day, probably not, but you are talking with your manager uh, every day. They're oftentimes the hiring manager, so your first point of entry into that candidate employee experience. Um, I've definitely thought differently about my expectations and had that conversation with my manager since the pandemic started as well. How do you resource and empower managers to really create a best in class experience on their individual teams? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, onboarding is so critical and managers really play a key role in this. At GCI, they the managers have a lot of HR support for the first couple of weeks of onboarding in terms of setting up key meetings for the new hire. So the new hire really comes in and I can speak to this from my own personal experience with a sense that people have invested time into what the first two weeks will look like. Um, but as we came into the organization, I've been with the organization for about seven months, we launched something in addition to the orientation process called an introduction exercise. Um, and it's meant for new hires, but also for people within the organization who are new at working together. And this introduction exercise is a PDF that's editable that each side kind of fills out, the employee and the manager. And it really talks through how do you prefer to communicate? How do you like to receive feedback? And then I think what's most important on the personal side of life is to say, you know, what is important to you that you feel comfortable telling me about? And that's when you might hear something like, you know, I have, um, you know, a family member who's aging, who lives in my household, and we do, you know, um, you know, appointments in uh, on Friday afternoons. So it's really important for me to be able to go to that appointment. It creates this place of not having assumptions be made about what is this person doing on a Friday afternoon, but now we know that that's a very, um, you know, sacred time to that person and the manager is equipped now to give them the support that they need. Um, in addition, we also do just check-ins with our new hires at 60, 90, um, uh, days, and then all new hires receive a six-month initial performance review um, based on uh, 360 feedback. We're really big on 360 feedback in our industry. Uh, we feel like it's important that we we gather that so people have a clear sense of how they're seen in the organization and know where they, they can kind of focus um, where they are impacting um, the, the best because I think 360 feedback helps you see yourself in that very well-rounded way. I really like the question you asked uh, that managers can also ask to their team in terms of what is personal to you, but that you feel comfortable sharing with me as well. So not assuming that everybody is going to feel comfortable bringing, you know, everything to work and having vulnerable conversations on day one as well, really building that trust and, and working together to co-create a really great uh, place to work too. In terms of uh, another question you asked of how you like to receive feedback or, or give feedback, uh, this is often a time where you could uh, get that constructive feedback or receive it as a manager, and there could be some conflict or you have unexpected conversations. Nobody has a, a crystal ball, so we can't expect them, but I think conflict is not necessarily a bad word, and you're bound in any relationship to have conflict. One study found that only 39% of folks were really trained or coached on how to handle workplace uh, conflicts as well. How do you resource folks, especially managers, to have these hard conversations? 
you know, um, that statistic really doesn't surprise me just based on what I see in the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's really natural for humans to want to avoid conflict. It's uncomfortable. Um, but at GCI, we've rolled out training around difficult conversations. Um, but I will say most of the impact that my HR team is having um, on, is in these one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations with leaders. Um, we take this approach of we're in this together and yet you're going to be challenged to enter some uncomfortable places. Um, but I think that that's where leaders really grow best is in a place where they're challenged, but they have a sense of support is there when they need it. Um, and that's the approach that we take. Absolutely. I think that definitely makes sense. And just being able to lean into that and recognize as humans, we might kind of avoid conflict, but this is how we get through it as well. Just like any other skill too, we have to practice it and be intentional. Um, we've mentioned this throughout the conversation, but want to ask the direct question too around what role does really the employee voice have in your people and culture strategy at GCI Health? Yeah, the um, the voice of our employees is absolutely critical. Um, I would say not only for the people strategy, but also for our, our business strategy, because at GCI, our business is our people because we're a professional services firm. Um, so especially with people at the center, we have to be always listening to our employees. So we... Um, I mentioned earlier that GCI did its first annual employee engagement survey in late 2021. We recently did a second employee engagement survey in the middle of this year. Um, so we're getting feedback in these more um, regular sort of ways, but then also through pulse surveys on learning and development sessions that we receive. We're always looking for feedback that's going to inform where we go from here um, because we recognize there's always going to be some way to learn and improve. Um, Another thing that's really big at GCI is making sure our people programs are informed before we launch them from feedback from staff. So sometimes, you know, you know, we'll be talking to an employee, they have a great idea, we start to put something together, but then, you know, we take it to a few key people that we think will have the perspective of client facing roles and be able to challenge us to think about how to make it work for people, especially since the majority of our employees are client facing. It's important that we don't launch programs that um, you know just check a box, but that will really be used. Yeah, we definitely don't. We're not fans of box checkers here uh, as well. And people can tell when, when you're doing that too. And I think we've talked a lot about the the how and the strategy behind it, kind of the different ways that you're really encouraging mentorship, professional development, and that connection. What is your philosophy around really measuring a sense of belonging and kind of the progress being made, knowing that we don't want to check boxes, but we also know that what gets measured gets invested in, um, and you constantly want to be iterating the employee experience? Yeah. I think belonging is such an important topic, and I really feel like belonging is the output of the DEI journey that GCI has been on for about two years now. Um, you know, I'm glad to report that our more recent employee engagement survey has specific questions on belonging that are going to start to be the benchmarks that we can use for moving forward. But if I could I don't know if this is too much of a simplified answer, but I truly believe that retention and growth metrics are the signs of belonging. If people are staying with a company and they're growing with a company, that means to me that they feel like they can they belong there and that they have a home with the organization. So we're looking very critically at our attrition rates on a monthly basis. We're looking at how we promote people and where we're promoting people um, and just keeping a very tight eye on that. Um, but ultimately, I think retention is going to be the biggest um, KPI for us when it comes to belonging. Yeah, are people staying? Why are people staying? Are people growing? And how are they growing at the organization too? Are good uh, metrics and questions to, to continually ask? I know stay interviews have been something that a lot of folks have been talking about too. Uh, in terms of since the pandemic has started, there's been a lot of conversations around HR people, talent teams really having a stronger seat at the table, having different perceptions. I think even, you know, past the pandemic as well, there's been a lot of changes in the perceptions of uh, HR in general. 
what from your perspective has been uh, that change over time and how people view the, the function and the team uh, overall? Yeah, I love this question because having done HR for the majority of my career, I've really seen a lot of change in the, fi the field um, over time, um, namely from being more of that back office function, being more downstream to being more front facing and more upstream and involved at the front end of business decisions. So, you know, our impact is definitely felt more because I think the challenge with finding and retaining talent is just getting more and more um, complex um, as the years have gone on. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the key ways that I think HR has changed when I think about when I started versus where I am today is that the role is very much seen as a coach um, and this having this very key role of being able to influence the organization through leadership coaching. And we are always looking for those ways to kind of push our leadership to think differently about things, to see things from a different perspective, to be more inclusive, um, to consider other perspectives. Um, and I feel like that is something that I spent less time on um, or I saw HR spending less time on at the beginning of my career and much more time on now. So I do think HR is being set up to have a very big impact in an organization. Um, and yet, you know, we have quite a bit of remit under, under us. So my thought would be for HR folks, um, you know, is, you know, lean into those opportunities to influence. Yeah. Lean into those opportunities to influence, think creatively, think differently as leaders, um, and really leverage the the experience and perspective of HR for these business decisions as well, because your people, in my opinion, are your greatest assets um, to your company as well. Uh, Nessa, we've talked about a lot throughout our conversation, but I want to pass the mic back to you to see if there's anything that I didn't specifically ask that you want to share with folks who are listening, or if you want to underscore any key takeaways. Yeah, you know, I just want to say, first of all, I'm very honored to be GCI's first global people leader. This is a newly created position. And I think with a lot of newly created position, it's first coming in and evaluating what the needs are and then sort of being able to deliver on that. Um, I, you know, speaking to the last point about the role of HR, um, I know that a lot of HR practitioners like me in the field are feeling very burned out, very tired at this point in the, this past two plus years. Um, and what I would want to say to them is whatever you need to do to kind of pour back into yourself so that you can kind of relight the fire within you, um, you know, is important to do. Um, when we talked about wellness at the, at the top of the call, you know, I think that it's important to, you know, have that same sort of care for yourself as an HR leader, the work that we do is very intensive on the on the emotional output side of things. So we have to be taking care of ourselves. But I'm so excited to be at GCI. It's a big learning laboratory for me. I'm loving the leadership there. They're allowing me to take risks and uh, to try new things. And it's been a lot of fun. Yes, um, it definitely sounds like it's a lot of fun and also your passion for the, the role and also the people and the creativity is definitely apparent there. Nessa, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Thank you so much, Christina. It's been a pleasure. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood and know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.